Moses had told the children of Israel as they made their way into the land in the book of Deuteronomy that there would come a time when the children of Israel would call for themselves a king. And Moses had stipulated very carefully and very clearly to them that that king would be one whom the Lord had chosen. And we're going to be looking this week at the first king of Israel, Saul. A man, to all intents and purposes, had everything that he could have ever wanted. Came from a wealthy home, a loving family, many possessions, an imposing physical character and presence. And he also had the love of the nation. But more importantly, brothers and sisters, he had a willing and loving God who was determined to make this man succeed. And what we're going to see this afternoon in our first address is we're going to look at a bit of the background to the reign of King Saul. What was taking place in the nation of Israel at that time? And and I think it's very important for us to to look a little closer at the prayer of Hannah because I feel that it provides a lot of helpful context in understanding that first reign. We're going to see that God and Samuel, Samuel is God's representative, they were companions, they had fellowship with one another, They, they worked together in the nation of Israel. There was God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, as the king of Israel. And there was Samuel as judge and priest and prophet. And they worked together, that they collaborated together in the nation of Israel. But there came a time when God's people turned and they called for themselves a king. And we're going to see that at that moment in time, brothers and sisters, though the Lord had made provision, very careful provision, for a king to be appointed, This is not what the God of Israel wanted. For many years then, God himself was the king over the nation of Israel. We can see that all the way through the book of Judges. But where I'd like us to begin this afternoon is in the final chapter of Judges, in the final verse. Let's have a look at Judges 21, verse 25. Throughout this book of Judges, Yahweh, the God of Israel, was the king over the nation. But there we read these words, which we all know well. Verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. There was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And we're now going to come to a period of total chaos and anarchy. We're going to see that there was a downward plunge from living under the rule of God to living under the rule of self. And it was going to have catastrophic consequences. I'd like us to begin then in this little journey together. Come with me to Joshua chapter 24. We're going to see now some of the final words that Joshua expressed the children of Israel before he died. And they were to make a choice. And we're going to see all the way through the life of Samuel and Saul that there is this harking back to Joshua, the saviour of Israel. So here then in Joshua chapter 24, we see this challenge. This challenge from this man of faith, a man who had committed his life to God. Joshua 24, then in verse 14. We can see in the final words of this chapter that that Joshua is going to pass off the scene. These are very, very important and poignant words of this great man. Now therefore, fear the Lord, we read there in verse 14, and, and serve him in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood. And in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And then these well-known words here. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, to serve Yahweh, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in which or whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house... We will serve Yahweh. 
And as we go through the passages, we will find that that generation that lived during the time of Joshua, they did serve Yahweh, but their children did not. Well, first of all, then there's a, there's a good response. Just turn over a few pages to Judges chapter 2 now, and we'll pick up the account in verse 7. Judges chapter 2 and verse 7. And the people served Yahweh all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. So we see there a good response. But you go down to verse 10 and you can see that a calamity is about to break out into the nation. And verse 10, and also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers and there arose another generation after them which knew not Yahweh. Notice that, 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 the immediate generation after Joshua. The immediate generation, brothers and sisters, nor yet ye for the works which ye have done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, or sight of Yahweh there, and served Balaam. And we go on, and they forsook Yahweh, God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods, of the gods, the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the, the Lord to anger, and they forsook Yahweh, and served Baal and Ashtaroth. And you can see on the screen here, it's, uh, it's uh, in the Louvre a Museum, those of you who have been to Paris, and you can see there um, a tablet and stone of Baal, um, the god of weather, from this very time, brothers and sisters. Can you believe that it wasn't just the that the children of Canaan and the surrounding nations, it wasn't something that just belonged to the Zidonians, which would be ushered in by, by, by Queen Jezebel. This was something that prevailed within the land of Israel right after Joshua departed from the scene. It is catastrophic, brothers and sisters. And this is going to be very helpful to understand, really, the background to uh, these words that we're going to read together in Samuel, and particularly the beginning of the reign of King Saul. But there's a very powerful lesson in all of this, brothers and sisters. It's a very simple one, isn't it? When we choose to lose God in our lives, then we do ultimately lose him, don't we, brothers and sisters? And we can see how quickly God is lost in the lives of those who choose to lose God. That's what happened to the children of Israel, that they chose to, to lose, to depart from the ways of Yahweh. And so then, they were lost to God. What a powerful lesson that is at the outset of our studies here. And we can be like that. We can be so consumed and obsessed in, in pursuing the gods of this world, brothers and sisters, that we are at risk of losing our God. Though we are here, uh, the children of Israel were encamped as a, an encampment in Israel at this time, but they still lost Yahweh their God. And the saddest thing when we read of the context of these words is that they didn't even appreciate that they'd lost God. That, that, for me, is the saddest aspect of this entire narrative. They didn't even know that they'd lost God. Let that be a lesson to us, brothers and sisters, all of us, you and for me. So what we want to do now, we've looked at the background. This choice that Joshua presented the children of Israel. And we're going now from this broad canvas of idolatry to a single canvas of one individual person named Hannah. But I'm going to suggest to you, brothers and sisters, that it wasn't an individual canvas at all. I believe this prayer is something far more, far deeper and far more meaningful that we, we might appreciate on, on, on quick reading. Come with me to 1 Samuel chapter 1 then. So, so we come to this, um, this individual canvas here of Hannah. And we read that she was praying for a child, that she was barren. But she wasn't barren, brothers and sisters, was she? She, she wasn't barren at all, was she? As, as you read these words carefully, we, we see that the Lord had closed up her womb. That, that there's something... Uh, fundamentally different between being barren naturally and the Lord God intervening in the life of this woman and closing up her womb. Uh, there was something meaningful. There was a particular purpose that was going to be developed here and a lesson that was going to be drawn out. You, you can see in, in verses 5 and 6 actually how God 
um, intervenes and, and shuts up the womb. It's mentioned twice for emphasis, as we know in Scripture. Anything that is mentioned in a repeated way, it is there for emphasis. And, and this situation was particularly acute, wasn't it? Because her husband, Elkanah, had another wife, Penina, who had children. And we can see there that this woman, Penina, notice in verse 6, she became the adversary or the rival of Hannah. This is not a picture of domestic bliss, is it, by any means? Uh, this is not a picture of happiness or contentment. In fact, we see strife and envy and jealousy in all of this, brothers and sisters. This is a, a particular difficult scene to look at. And perhaps some of us in the room have experienced something like this. A woman wanting a child, brothers and sisters. For those who want a child, I've been told that there is nothing more acute in the pain of wanting a child, particularly being surrounded by those that have been blessed with children. It's hard not to sympathise in Hannah's situation here, brothers and sisters. And so God was shutting up her womb. Why? This, this faithful woman, she was a faithful woman. Surely there were other ways for God to intervene into her life so that she could enter into God's kingdom. Why was it this, brothers and sisters, of all the, 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 the means by which God could choose to bring about salvation in this family, why does he choose to hold her womb in his hand? Well, brothers and sisters, I believe that this is symbolic. Because in the book of Deuteronomy, God tells us quite clearly that the nation of Israel would become barren if they had committed themselves to idolatry. Keep your finger in 1 Samuel chapter 1. I want you to come back to Deuteronomy chapter 28 here. So Hannah is a victim of this curse that we're going to read of here in Deuteronomy chapter 28. But I would suggest that her barrenness is a figure of the state of Israel. Just going to pick out a few verses here, Deuteronomy chapter 28, and we'll begin in verse 2, just to make the point. And all those blessings, so remember these are the final words of Moses before he departs from an, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Verse 4, blessed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy ground. And the fruit of thy cattle and increase of thy kind and the, and the flocks of thy sheep. And then if you go all the way down to verse 18. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land and increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. So right away we see that she was a victim of this curse. But I believe it's something far more important, profound than this, because I believe now that Hannah takes on this symbol of the nation of Israel. And so then, in other words, brothers and sisters, this is not a, a domestic crisis by any means. Her, her prayer is a petition, a petition that uh, goes above, transcends her natural feelings, acute feelings for a child. I believe, brothers and sisters, that she is desperate for a man-child to restore God's people to him. Just notice what, what it says there. Remember those closing words in the book of uh, Judges. It says there that every man did that which was right in the, his own house. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, now keep those words in mind and come back to 1 Samuel chapter 1. And we've seen here that this symbol of barrenness is a figure of the state of Israel, how they chose Baal and, and Astaroth as their, their choice gods here. And notice, uh, it's picked out in the margin. If you look at verse 11, if you go down to the end of verse 11, uh, this wonderful petition, which I believe transcends rises above her own domestic situation. And now I believe she's praying on behalf of the nation here. She says there, but wilt thou give unto thine handmaid a man-child? We know that Mary is going to pick up these very words many years later. But notice that, brothers and sisters, she calls for a man-child. Have a look in your margin. What does it say by man-child? Well, I've got here the seed of men. It's a it's a phrase of the covenant. It is a language of Genesis 3 verse 15, isn't it, brothers and sisters? It's language of Genesis 12 and thereon. 
It is the Abrahamic, it is an Abrahamic expression. Every man did that which was right in their own eyes and there was no king. And now she calls for a man-child, a seed of man. Because every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So she calls for a man, but not any man, brothers and sisters, not just a child. She could see what was happening in the priesthood with Eli and Hophni and Phinehas. It was gone. It was corrupt. There was no king. The nation of Israel needed a man child, a strong man, a man of God to return God's people back to Yahweh. Can you see that? How wonderful, brothers and sisters, how wonderful that is that she calls for a savior. Now, um, this is emphasized a little later. Um, a bit behind on the slides here. But, but notice if we go down to um, verse 20, we, we know that this child is going to be called Samuel. And you notice there at the end of verse 20, because I have asked him of the Lord. Now, you may know, those of you who um, understand Hebrew will know that that's in the present term. The idea of Samuel is that he is hearing. Uh, and that's going to be a, a constant contrast with Saul. He didn't just hear. He's hearing all the time with Samuel. Okay, hearing or asking of the Lord. But notice in verse 28 that when God graciously provided this son to Hannah, then you notice these words in verse 28, therefore also have I lent him to the Lord, says Hannah. So she asks the Lord for a child and then she lends the child back to God. But what's really powerful here is that that word, Lent in verse 28 and the word asked in verse 20 at the end is the same Hebrew word. So in other words, brothers and sisters, we're getting something very powerful here. This woman, very mindful of the state of Israel, she asks for a child, a man seed. And in return, Yahweh, the God of Israel, asks for him back for full service. Isn't that wonderful, brothers and sisters? Isn't that wonderful that God asks him back? And Samuel is a unique character in Scripture. He only shares this characteristic with the Lord Jesus Christ, where we read of him serving the nation of Israel all his life. He's the only man in Scripture that served the nation of Israel all his life. A wonderful figure of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there's a few things I'd like to point out here because it's this vow here. Uh, uh, notice Elkanah, look at the end of verse 21. We see that Elkanah made this vow of Hannah his vow. Now, I want you just to a moment, just, just imagine that. You, you're very mindful of what's happening in Shiloh with Eli, Hophni and Phinehas and the terrible corruption that's taking place there. And you commit a vow that you ask for a child and in return, God asked for him back. But we know under the law, provisions were made for a vow made by a woman. Numbers chapter 30. Have a look at it in your own time. And it tells us very clearly that a vow could be annulled if a vow was committed by a woman. The vow could be annulled by the husband or the father. But can you see here, brothers and sisters, though provision had been made by for, for Alcana to revoke this, this covenant, this vow, he makes this his vow too. Can you see that? Because this wasn't merely having a child. The, the purpose of this child was to give the child back to the nation of Israel. That there was no purpose in keeping the child because the very reason for the child was to give the child to the nation of Israel. Can you see that? Isn't it wonderful, brothers and sisters? So Elkanah then makes his vow, his vow, though provision was made to revoke that vow. And we've got these lovely little expressions here. If you go to um, um, verse 19 here of, 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 of chapter 2, um, you can see here that um, a lot of love was um, invested in making this little coat notice here. Hannah goes to Shiloh once a year and she goes every year with this coat and, uh, and this young Samuel was growing as we've seen our own children grow year by year. Many of you have commented on how much um, our children have grown 
Well, Samuel was no different, brothers and sisters. And you can see here, moreover, his mother made him a little coat and, and brought it to him year by year. And when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice, so they were committed together to bring about a restoration of God's people. A husband and wife team. Isn't that wonderful, brothers and sisters? A husband and wife team with the sole intent of raising a child to bring about the salvation of God's people. Well, I'm sure you know that that little coat, it's uh, an unusual word, the word coat there. Um, you'll notice in your margin, it's the word robe, but it has a very specific meaning. It's the robe of the ephod. Um, you can go all the way back to Exodus chapter 28 and verse uh, 31. And you find that it is the robe of the ephod that was worn by the high priest. And each year, this Hannah, this, this lovely woman, she's preparing this little priestly garment because she recognizes that the priesthood is entirely corrupt. But there, though he wasn't of the, the lineage to be a high priest, there was this righteous priesthood being raised with this high expectation of bringing about a restoration of God's people. Can you see that? Can you imagine that scene, brothers and sisters? What a touching scene that was. This, this little Samuel, dressed as a little high priest, as he made his way around the tabernacle. And in all the darkness, the spiritual darkness, this was the ray of hope. The only beam of hope in the nation was this little child, Samuel, a man who was distinguished as someone who committed his life to God's people. It's quite a thing, isn't it, to make a vow. You, you may have made vows in your own life. We've all made vows at our baptism, haven't we, brothers and sisters? It's another thing to make a vow of this magnitude, knowing that you can reverse it. But she followed through with her husband. And it's a hard thing, isn't it, to, to commit our children to the service of the Lord. We're not really in that position as Hannah, are we? Things are very different in this dispensation, in the new covenant, compared to the old. Our children make their own choices. We can raise a godly chief, but at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, our children make their own choices in life, don't they? So what can we do? Well, we can make a vow in relation to our children, can't we? When we have them, we can make a vow that we will invest our time with them around God's word. That's what we can do. And that's what we're asked to do. Brothers and sisters, that's what we're commanded to do. To invest our time. Though our children will, when they hit the years of maturity, make their own decision in life. We can make that vow. And isn't it wonderful when we all come together at a Bible school like this and we can see our children. And we know for this week, one week in the year, but in this week we're doing the right thing. It's the other 51 weeks of the year that we need to do the right thing, brothers and sisters. But we can make that vow, and we should make that vow to our children. Well, this is a lovely prayer here in 1 Samuel chapter 2. We haven't got time to look at it, but one thing I want to highlight for you is that this is the first time that the name Jesus Christ is mentioned. You may know that, you may not know it, but it's important to highlight. If you look at the end of verse 1, at the beginning of this prayer, it's like two bookends here. Uh, the, the, the words are expressed because I rejoice in my or thy salvation. Whose salvation? Yah salvation. That is the name of Jesus, brothers and sisters. If you haven't got that marked in your Bible, it's worth noting that. That's the first time we come across the name Jesus in your scripture. And like two bookends here, you go all the way down to verse 10. And at the end, the very last words are the concluding words of this prayer, and no wonder Mary picks them up under inspiration so many years later when she hears news that she's got the begotten seed. Give strength unto his kingdom and exalt the horn of his anointed, the centuagent, has of his Christ. There you've got it. Two bookends. Jesus Christ spelt out there for you. This child who was going to commit his life to the nation of Israel. What a wonderful fitting parallel that is to the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and in these two bookends, brothers and sisters, you've got some wonderful things expressed about a king and a priest to come. A king and a priest to come. But what I want you to notice here are some of the words that are mentioned in verse 10. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces, but of heaven shall he thunder 
upon them. I want you to notice that. We're going to come across that phrase a little later. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his anointed. And what I'd like you to do, I want you to decouple those final words there in verse 10, because it speaks of a king and of his anointed. And I want to suggest to you, brothers and sisters, that what, what Hannah is talking about here is a king at the end of verse 10. But not one king, but many kings. The idea here of this, this word king is a, an ideal king, a supreme king. A model king. That's what she wants in the nation of Israel. That there was no king in Israel. Everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. The, the final words of Judges chapter 21. So she asked for a king, an ideal king, there and then. She wants a king. God made provision for a king, but the right king. But of this ideal king, it will lead up to his anointed. The last king. And to the benefit of hindsight, we can look back and we can appreciate that this was going to be a catalyst through the life of David. David was going to be the first ideal king and it will lead up to the exaltation of the horn of his anointed, the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest son of David. But the reason why I really stress and emphasize these words to you, brothers and sisters, this was the prayer of Hannah. And I'm going to show you this week that these words could have belonged to Saul. They could have belonged to Saul, brothers and sisters. Yes, there was going to be Jesus Christ. And I believe David was always in the mind of the Heavenly Father. Always in the mind. But Saul could have been the first king of Israel that was an ideal king. We're going to see that God did not set Saul up for failure. By any means, by no means, brothers and sisters, did he do that. So I believe then these final words here at the end of the prayer of Hannah set the structure, set the structure for Samuel. She's raising a priest. The priest is being raised by Eli, a priest. And now she wants a king. And brothers and sisters, this is so moving. She longs for a king and a priest to work together. To bring about God's restoration. She knows a priest is in waiting. Her own son. But she wants him to cooperate with the king. To bring about God's righteousness in Israel. Brothers and sisters. And I believe that is the framework. That's going to help us to understand. A bit of the context. And some of the detail. As we work our way through the book of Samuel. Well, they're lovely words, but we do need to move on because we are dealing with the life of Saul. So very soon after these words are expressed here, tragedy strikes the nation of Israel. The Ark of the Covenant is stolen by the Philistines and the sons of Eli were killed. And remember the words that young Samuel had to tell Eli that God was going to raise for him a, a faithful priesthood. And the whole family of Eli were going to die. And this was the beginning. The sons of Eli, Hophni and Phileas, they were killed in their foolishness in, in relation to the ark. But what I want you to notice here, brothers and sisters, and it's a little detail, but I don't know whether you've um, appreciated these words. If I were to ask you, how does Eli die? This is very significant. Remember, I believe that, 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 that Hannah here is praying for a king and a priest. So what's happening with the present priest? A man who'd raised Samuel. Well, if you go down to verse 18, you see that when he hears, that he had nothing to do with his sons. Frankly, he didn't really care too much about his sons. But when he heard that the Ark of the Covenant had been taken by the Philistines, what happened? He falls off the back of his chair and he breaks his neck. Now, that's very significant. The events that took place after the children of Israel came out of Egypt through Passover. When we come to Exodus chapter 13, have a look at it in your own time. Exodus chapter 13, verse 13. Uh, God tells the children of Israel, I want you to, to remember what I did when I brought you out of Egypt. And I don't want you to memorialize Passover. I want you to remember something on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and the means by which you're going to remember this, I want you to take an ass. And an ass was a symbol of uncleanness, and it spoke of the nation of Israel. 
And you can redeem that ass by providing a lamb. You can kill a lamb, and that lamb can atone for the ass, this unclean symbol of you. But if no lamb is provided, what was going to happen to the ass? Can you remember? The neck was to be broken. In other words, it was cast out. It was unredeemable. And, and brothers and sisters, the powerful lesson in all of this, that's exactly what happened to Eli's priesthood. The neck was broken. It was unredeemable. It was cast out. Brothers and sisters, it's tragic. It is absolutely tragic what's happening in Israel at this time. And we're going to see in a moment that for 20 years after, they're serving Baal and Ashtoreth. You cannot imagine the wickedness that is happening at this time. So Eli's, Eli's off the scene. He's died. He's, his entire priesthood is unredeemable. Can you believe that? Unredeemable. That the priest was there to propitiate, wasn't he, for the nation of Israel. But it's unredeemable. Nothing could redeem now. Eli's priesthood. As we work down chapter 4, you can see that Ichabod is born, um, who's going to be a son of Phineas here. Um, but in childbirth, the, uh, the mother of Ichabod dies uh, because of this tragic situation. The name of this child is Ichabod. The glory is departed from Israel. You can see there in verse 21. And then in verse 22, the glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken. And brothers and sisters, this is at an all-time low point in the nation of Israel. God's presence has now been taken from them, and they are alone. And if we look carefully at the narrative, it is at this moment in time where we begin to see the murmurings, the development in the camp of Israel. We want a king. We want a king. And as I've already told you, there was provision under the law to make them a king, but it's not in the way that they asked, brothers and sisters. It's not in the way that they asked. Well, let's go over to chapter 7 now. And um, this is shocking. Because Israel remained in fear of the Philistines for 20 years. Can you remember how the Ark of the Covenant had gone into the land of the Philistines and all the gods had fallen over and they're struck with all these horrible diseases and the Philistines themselves, they're fearful of Yahweh, the God of Israel. Yet at the same time, for 20 years, the children of Israel were fearful of the Philistines. There was nothing to fear. There was nothing to fear, brothers and sisters. There Gods of the Philistines were utterly powerless. Look at this, verse 3 of chapter 7. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel. If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods of Ashtoreth and from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the land of the Philistines. And notice for how long this had been taking place. At the end of verse 2, for 20 years. Astaroth and Balaam, I don't need to tell you the kind of worship that took place that was involved in Astaroth and Balaam. It was of the most wicked kind. This was not passive religion, brothers and sisters. This is unequaled wickedness. And the Ark of the Covenant had already shown its superiority of all the gods of the Philistines, yet they were like this for 20 years. And brothers and sisters, sometimes we're no different, are we? This is irrational, this is illogical, isn't it? Yet they continue to behave like this. How we've seen God's providential hand in our lives. The, the amazing events that we've seen just this past week. The various anniversaries of God's people this year and next. Yet we still continue in our deceitfulness and our wickedness, don't we, brothers and sisters? It's irrational, isn't it? We can see God's powerful hand providentially working in the nations, working in our own personal lives, but we still continue. We're no different, are we? So that's the lesson, isn't it? These lessons are here for our own learning. We're no different, are we, brothers and sisters? 
Well, remember, I, I began with some words of Joshua, and now Samuel is going to take on the figure of Joshua here. So, so in the context of the 20 years of suffer, uh, suffering, serving Balaam and Ashtoreth, look at the words here in verse 5 of, of chapter 7. And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. He gathers them to Mizpah. Can you remember the significance of Mizpah? Can you? What happened at Mizpah? A horrid event happened at Mizpah. You, you, you read of that in Judges 20 and 21. It's the unfortunate incident of the concubine. The Levites' concubine. Can you remember that? And the division of the twelve pieces and how all of Israel, we read in Judges chapter 20, came to Mizpah. And they were going to wipe out the Benjamites. That's interesting, isn't it? Because Saul came from the tribe of Benjamin. There was a breach. There was a division in the land, we read in those closing chapters of Judges there. And the immorality that took place there with that concubine. God is reminding now God's people of the wickedness and the immorality of Ashtaroth and Balaam. This was an event in their history, brothers and sisters in Judges, that they wanted to, 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 to forget. To brush under the carpet. But now it's presented back to them. And the wickedness that they were committing in their lives at Mizpah. But there's something else. As I said, I believe that Samuel now takes on a, a Joshua figure. Come back with me to Joshua chapter 24, please. Joshua chapter 24. And I believe the children of Israel would have remembered a, a very similar gathering, but it wasn't at Mizpah. This was at Shechem, the burden bearer. Joshua chapter 24 then. We're in the same chapter which we looked at earlier. Uh, this chapter where, where Joshua presents this challenge to God's people when he uh, departs from them. So Joshua chapter 24 then in verse 1. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel. I want you to notice some of the details here. And for their heads and for their judges and for their officers and they pre presented themselves before God, notice. This is all about God searching their hearts and their minds. If you go down, uh, look at a, a cluster of verses, verses 14 to 18, you can get the sense of what these words are all about. Now, therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and truth, notice in verse 14. At the end of verse 14, serve ye the Lord. Again, serve ye the Lord in verse 15, choose you this day whom ye serve. You, you get the idea. And then if we go down to verse 23 and pick up the account there, these are the specific words of Joshua here. Now therefore put away the strange gods which are among you. Remember, remember the challenge that Samuel presents to God's people. They'd served Balaam and Ashtoreth for 20 years. And they had all said everything that God has said at the mount we will do. They'd made a commitment to Joshua and this is what Samuel is reminding them of, of a generation past, how they committed to Yahweh and they failed. Now, therefore, put away the strange gods which are among you and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, Yahweh our God, we will serve and his voice we will obey. One generation after Joshua, they were serving all the surrounding nations, the gods of the surrounding nations, brothers and sisters. They didn't keep true to the words, did they? So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statue and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone. I want you to notice that. He gathers them to one people. He reminds them of Yahweh, the God of Israel, whom they should serve. And then to memorialize this covenant, he establishes here this great stone in the midst of them. And he sets up under an oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us. For it hath heard all the words of the Lord which he spake unto us. 
it shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God, this witness, this memorial, this stone, that was to remind them, brothers and sisters, of the commitment they had made, the covenant that they had cut with Yahweh, the God of Israel. Now with those thoughts in mind, come back to 1 Samuel, please. And we're going to see very similar details here in the way that Samuel now brings God's people together. Well, he'd been reminding them, hadn't he, that Yahweh was superior to Ashtaroth and Balaam. And you could notice, notice these words here. Notice these words here in 1 Samuel 7 and verse 10. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines, in this, this covenant that was being made, the Philistines, they could see that, that, that Israel were preoccupied in this. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel, but the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomforted them, and they were smitted before Israel. Once again, he reminded God's people that he was far superior than the Philistines, the power of the Philistines. But what's the little detail there, brothers and sisters? Well, it's this great I don't know if you noticed when we were looking at 1 Samuel 2. Keep a finger in 1 Samuel 7. It's Yahweh's signature. This was in accordance to Hannah's prayer. Come back to 1 Samuel chapter 2 and look at verse 10 again. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. Notice that. That was Yahweh's signature. They were going to call upon a king to fight against the nations. They were very concerned about the Philistines, but there was no reason to be concerned about the Philistines because Yahweh discomforted the Philistines with his signature. I am Yahweh, this is my thunder. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth and he shall give strength unto his king. And with this signature of thunder, brothers and sisters, he was reminding them that he was their king. But when they chose a king whom he had chosen, he would strengthen this king. Can you see that? This, this thunder in the sky reminded them of two things, really. First of all, I am Yahweh, and I can discomfort all the nations of the earth. I am Yahweh, your king. But if you do choose a king whom I have chosen, then I will strengthen that king. Can you see that? It's, it's a comfort in, in two measures, isn't it? I'm your king. If you choose another king that I appoint, I will strengthen that king. Though allowances have been made under the law, I will strengthen that king. So when you come back uh, to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 7, what happens here? Well, if you go down to verse 12, as a standing memorial here, Samuel places a stone at Mizpah, just as a stone was set at Shechem. Can you see that? Where this this this. This point of decisioning in the life of Israel as jo Joshua was about to pass off the scene. It is now repeated under Samuel. Samuel now stands up as this saviour figure. And this question again is repeated. And, and this stone is going to be called um, Ebenezer. Notice there in verse 12. The stone of help. God was going to help them. Whether he was going to help them as their king. Or help them through their king. He would still Help them, And it was going to be a standing memorial that God could defeat the Philistines. There it was, this stone of Ebenezer. And it was going to stand as a memorial that God could defeat the Philistines. And that's interesting because we're going to see in a moment how the children of Israel desired a king that was going to defeat the Philistines. There's no reason why they should be thinking in that way because God had defeated the Philistines. This is a memorial. The stone of Ebenezer stood there as a witness to that fact. When well, we come to 1 Samuel chapter 8 now, we come forward in time. And you can see in uh, just the opening words, really, of chapter 8. And it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now, just notice that phrase, was old. Again, um, just looking at the Hebrew here, that the Hebrew actually doesn't suggest that he was old. It suggests that he was feeling old. I'm sure many of us have felt like that at times. He was feeling old. 
and, and we're going to see in this chapter, there's a spirit of compromise that happened when he was feeling old. Well, we can see in verse 2, now the name of his first one was Joel, and the name of his second, Abiah, they were judges in Beersheba. And we know that these sons were not good sons. And he places them in Beersheba, in the southern part of the land of Canaan, out of sight, out of mind, I think is the attitude, brothers and sisters. They were an embarrassment to him. And rather than dealing with them, he removed them. He didn't want to fully disclose what was going on. And so then, he would rather conceal them. Brothers and sisters, that's a really, really, really important lesson in all that. Samuel, this man who served the nation of Israel and God all the days of his life. A man, when he was... Growing up as a young Samuel, he could see how Eli had compromised. That was the message of the prophet to a young Samuel, how Eli had compromised over his sons. And so then, as a consequence, he was going to lose the priesthood. He would have known these lessons. But brothers and sisters, when this man was feeling old, he compromised over his two boys. A man who should have known better was Samuel. Brothers and sisters, we can be like that, can't we? And I don't want to be pointed in any of this. I've got a family that I'm raising myself. But it is an important scriptural principle that we should not turn a blind eye when things go wrong in our own families. God's righteousness has to be upheld. And it seemed the smallest compromise, didn't it? Just put my two sons out of sight. A small compromise. The consequence of that small compromise was catastrophic. The nation of Israel now demanded a king. Can you see that, brothers and sisters? The smallest compromise. It resulted in God's people turning against Yahweh and demanding a king. And that's the lesson, isn't it, brothers and sisters? Little compromise can have large consequences in family, in ecclesia, in the brotherhood. And we need to be very mindful of that in the, the decisions that we make. We pray that we might be wise, made wise by our loving Heavenly Father. So the nation now united comes against Samuel. Look at this, brothers and sisters. In verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel uh, gathered together and came to Samuel unto Ramah. And I want you to notice now a progression of their requests. Notice these words here. The request in verse 5. Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy white ways. That, that, that's, that's, the, that's the moment that triggered the request, the demand for a king. It was the the oversight of Samuel with his sons. Now make us a king to judge like all the nations. And then there is a development here in this request. If you go down to verse 6, give us a king to judge us. So, so first of all then, make us a king to judge us like the nations. Give us a king to judge us. And then um, it's all made clear when we go down to verse 19. The end of verse 19, nay, but we will have a king over us that we may also be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Can you see that? It's all brought together. Now, there was no reason to demand that. God had discomforted the Philistines, the very nation that they were fearful of. Why on earth did they need a king to go out before them and fight the battles? We read when God discomforted the Philistines at Ebenezer that it says all the days of Samuel's life, the hand of the Philistines didn't come near when Samuel lived, God made Samuel strong. And as Samuel was strong, Israel was strong. There was nothing to fear, brothers and sisters. This was not the time. This was not the time to be asking for a king. Not the time at all. Well, the elders of Israel were wise in diagnosing their trouble, but they were not wise in prescribing the cure, were they? They recognized the failure of Samuel's sons, but their proposed cure was to push God out. Just look at a few phrases here. Uh, notice this, brothers and sisters. Uh, 
they're so sad, aren't they? Where God says to Samuel, for they have not rejected thee. Look at those words there in verse 7. For they have not rejected thee. God could read Samuel's mind. No doubt Samuel was praying about this. He was greatly troubled and perplexed about this. A man who had served God all his life. I'm sure, brothers and sisters, we can all bring to mind certain moments in our own lives, in ecclesial life, where we've been criticised and our reactions over the smallest of criticisms. This was a man who faithfully served. He's got all his life, and now they want to make themselves a king. Let's empathise with this man, brothers and sisters. Let's truly feel for what this man was feeling. Personal rejection, but only personal rejection. That they had rejected his God. But notice that God has to say to Samuel, hearken unto their voice. Notice that phrase there three times, verse 7, verse 9, and verse 22. God, in other words, is saying to Samuel, I, I hear what they're saying, Samuel. And it breaks my heart too. But you've got to give them what they want. And he did that three times. And what a beautiful picture this is, brothers and sisters, of two friends. And I choose my words carefully. Abraham was a friend of God. This is a friendship that had been developed through a lifetime. God was speaking to Samuel as a young lad. Speak, servant, for speak, Lord, for thy servant here. This is a, a, a relationship that had developed into a, an intimate relationship. You can almost describe them as whispering friends, brothers and sisters. And this is a friend speaking to another friend, Samuel. You've got to do what they're asking. You've got to give them this king. But be assured, Samuel, I'm going to strengthen him. I'll make him a success. Remember the prayer of your mother? It's not what I want, but it's what we will do. Have a look at chapter 3, brothers and sisters, verse 19 here. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. All the way through his life, these two men, Samuel and Yahweh, the God of Israel, were talking one to another. They were very close and intimate companions at this stage. Samuel's an old man now, well, certainly feeling old. A lifetime of speaking to his God. And God has to speak to him as a friend. Listen to them. Listen to them, Samuel. And brothers and sisters, we're going to see in the life of Saul that he was never a friend of God's. He never developed any intimate relationship whatsoever. His heart was closed. And so were his ears. And brothers and sisters, what kind of friend are you to God? Really? Isaiah 50 comes to mind, doesn't it? How the Lord God spoke to the Lord Jesus Christ morning by morning and his ear was opened. So that he could give a word in season. What kind of friendship do you have? And that's going to be the striking contrast between Samuel and David and Saul. Samuel was a man who listened to his God, a a close, whispering companion. David was a man who listened to his God and he became a man after God's own heart. But Saul, if you can remember the phrase, was given, remember it? A new heart. Remember that? It's lovely, isn't it? We'll look at that later in the week. A new heart because his heart was cold. So God almost surgically gives him a new heart. Try this one, Saul. But that was no better. How can a heart work when the ears are closed? And so we should ask ourselves that question, brothers and sisters. Well, just a few thoughts before we close. I I just want to emphasize this point, that there was no reason at this point in time for them to call for a king. God had shown them so powerfully that he was the greatest king that they could ever desire to have. And particularly if they wanted the king to destroy their enemies, there was no reason for them to ask for this. Come back to uh, Exodus chapter 23, please. Exodus chapter 23. 
We're just going to quickly um, run through these verses just to prove the point. You know these verses well, but I want to put them into the context of how Samuel is feeling at this time. Remember, the children of Israel were making their way into the land and there was going to be an angel of the Lord's presence that was going to go ahead of them. And he was going to destroy the seven nations that were greater and mightier than them. Can you remember that, brothers and sisters? Exodus chapter 23 and verse 20. Behold, I send an angel before thee, says God, to keep thee in the way, to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Verse 23. For mine angel shall go before thee and bring thee into the uh, Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites. And you could add to the Philistines there, couldn't you, on that list, and the Jebusites. And I will cut them off. That The language couldn't even be any more emphatic, could it? Verse 30. By little and little. What a lovely phrase. By little and little. I will drive them out from before thee until thou be increased and inherit the land. God had shown them that he was their warrior, that he could defeat all the nations. But why were they asking for a king that would go before them and fight their enemies when God had been quite explicit in what he would do against their enemies? Heaven and this stone of Ebenezer. Shall we just quickly go there? 1 Samuel chapter 7. The stone of hell. 1 Samuel chapter 7 here and, and verse 10. And Samuel was offering uh, and the burnt offering. The Philistines drew near to the battle against the Lord, but, but against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder. Right? You can see them and discomforted them. And they were smitten before Israel. And then this, this verse that I alluded to. So the Philistines were subdued and they came no more into the coast of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. There's no reason to, to fear the Philistines. There was no reason to ask for a king at this time. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 4. I think it was the mind of the Philistines as well. I think the Philistines were, 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 were um, curious why the children of Israel were calling for a king at this time. Look at this. The Philistines were fearful that Yahweh was their king. They prefer any other king than Yahweh. 1 Samuel 4 verse 7. And, and this is the, um, the events that transpired when, when the Ark of the Covenant went into the land of the Philistines. Look at, look at the dialogue here. Look how the Philistines spoke to one another. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is among, or God is coming to the camp. And they said, woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods. These are the gods which smote the Egyptians and the plagues in the wilderness. That was Yahweh, he did all those things against the Egyptians. We're now frightened that this Yahweh is in our land. And he's going to destroy us like he destroyed the Philistines at the Egyptian side. Go over to chapter 6 now. Look at this. And this is how the Philistines spoke to one another. It's quite amusing, really. Halfway down verse 5. Give glory unto the God of Israel, the Philistines said to another Philistine. Peradventure he will lighten his hand from off you and from off your gods and from off your land. Wherefore then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh harden their hearts? When he had wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let the people go and they departed? Let's respect this. It's a fearful thing to come into the presence of the living God. So even the Philistines were concerned about Yahweh being their king. And so, brothers and sisters, we can begin to understand why Samuel was so heartbroken. Why it required God to speak to him three times to listen to God's people? No doubt he felt rejected and demoralized, but understandably so, given all these things that God had proven so powerfully and vividly in the life of the nation of Israel. I just want to go to one reference before we finish. I just want to leave these words with you before we go to the book of Deuteronomy. I just want to leave these words with you to reflect upon. This was the invisible God as their king. And they wanted a king that they could see. And brothers and sisters, I'm just going to ask you now. Is Christ the invisible king in your life? And we see two things that are required of a king. We saw that in 1 Samuel 8. That he will rule over us 
and he will go forth and fight our battles. Now bring that to yourselves, brothers and sisters. Does the Lord Jesus Christ as King, does he really, really reign in your hearts and minds? Do you fit your life around Christ, or does Christ fit his life around yours? Is he really king? And does he fight your battles? And we can only answer that question when we think about the, the insurmountable challenges that we may be facing. And do we become obsessive, anxious, preoccupied? Or do we give it to God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ? That is making Christ the invisible king in your life, brothers and sisters. Just want to leave those thoughts in your mind. But before we... We finish. Look at this. Um, come to 1 Samuel chapter 8. You, you may be already there, but, but the, the margin reference tells us that don't be surprised that these things are happening. Uh, notice there, now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Look in your margin and it takes you back, doesn't it? It takes you back to Deuteronomy chapter 17 verses 14 and 15. Can we finish there? Can we finish there, brothers and sisters? Deuteronomy chapter 17. And this is the chapter where um, we began, really, when we were making allusions to this provision under the law. A provision was made under the law that they could choose for themselves a king. So let's just read the words together and see whether you can observe, notice the difference between what we read here in Deuteronomy 17 and the words that we read in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Verse 14. When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall possess it, and shall dwell therein, and shall say, I will set a king over me, like as the nations that are about me. That's exactly what we've read, isn't it, in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom Yahweh thy God shall choose. Those words are not mentioned in 1 Samuel chapter 8. It's not what they said, it's what they didn't say. Can you see that? that they, they partly quoted Deuteronomy chapter 17, but they didn't quote that phrase. Isn't that true in ecclesial life? It's not sometimes what we say, it's what we don't say. It's what we omit to say. And, it, and it's not only what they didn't say, it's the spirit of this request. Samuel, an almighty God, could see that they wanted a king in their own image and in their own likeness. And that's what broke Samuel and God's heart, brothers and sisters. And in my mind at least, they knew who this man was. A man who was head and shoulders over the nation. A Benjamite, the son of Kish. He was already the favourite candidate, which God willing we will see tomorrow.